My name is Ben Loomer and I work at LEARN and I would like to welcome you all to our webinar, Fostering Resilience and Supporting Our Kids During Challenging Times. Um, I would like to thank you all for, for coming to what's been a really successful series that we've called Parenting in the Pandemic. Over the last year or so, the Center of Excellence for Mental Health have hosted a number of webinars, including helping our children regulate their emotions, supporting children through grief and loss, and my child is worried, how can I provide support? And you can find recordings of these videos on the Learn YouTube page. And I invite you to check it out. So with that, I would like to introduce our two presenters today. We have uh, Dr. Zmira King and Jana Gillis from the Center of Excellence for Mental Health. And they are going to be, again, presenting um, information on fostering resilience and supporting our kids during challenging times. So with that, I pass it over to you, Jana. Thanks, Ben. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I really appreciate everyone being here this evening uh, on a sunny Tuesday evening. We were talking how it's a little interesting to still be in the sunlight compared to some previous webinars in the winter. So it's a, it's a nice, hopeful feeling. Um, my name is Jana Gillis. I'm a family outreach consultant with the Lester B. Pearson School Board and a member of the Center of Excellence for Mental Health. And um, this is my colleague, um, Zamira King, who is a psychologist uh, and also part of the Center of Excellence for Mental Health, uh, working alongside of me at Lester B. Pearson. So tonight we want to talk to you about fostering resilience and supporting our kids during challenging times. Um, and we're just going to jump right in. So what is resilience anyway? When we, how do we define it? You know, there's, there's actually many definitions that we can draw on. And I like this one, this idea that it is a process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, or significant sources of stress. Um, it's important to remind ourselves that all children are capable of working through challenges and coping with stress. It, it's not something that kids either um, have or don't have. And sometimes I think there's this sense that we either possess you know, resilience or we don't. And that's really not the case. Resilience really is a skill um, that, that we develop as we grow. You know? and, and it's a skill that's developed particularly in the context of supportive relationships, particularly from us as parents. So resilience doesn't just sort of form on its own in a vacuum. We, we actually create it and we actually foster it. I also like this definition. I couldn't choose, I couldn't choose just one because there are so many. I like the way it stresses the mental and emotional uh, protection that resilience provides. All kids encounter stress, you know, to varying degrees as they grow. And despite our best efforts as parents, we just can't shield them from distress and, and sort of nor should we, which kind of flies in the face of you know, the strong parental instinct that we have to sort of protect our kids at all costs. And Zamir is going to speak more about this later. I mean, unfortunately, you know, our kids, um, they're going to face challenges, right? And they do face challenges. They, they may get picked on. They may experience academic struggle. Um, they'll have to cope with loss of various types and grief, conflict with friends. Um, family unrest. And, and currently, we are living through a global pandemic. So that certainly um, bolsters sort of this sense of, of unease. Okay, but resilience, it really does help kids navigate these stressful situations and scenarios, um, not alone, and, and certainly not perfectly, but they navigate them nonetheless. And it helps if we think of resilience as a skill to learn. Okay, when kids have the skill, and the confidence to sort of confront and work through, you know, their problems, they learn that they have what it takes, you know, that they, they, they are able to do this. And the more that they can sort of, you know, bounce back on their own or with our support, the more they internalize this message that they are strong and that they are capable. So it's like a muscle, okay, that we need to work. Um, we're not born resilient but we're actually born with the ability to become resilient. And while you know, our children bring their own sort of inborn personality and their own temperament to bear on their ability to be resilient, that's only part of it, right? They also, um, resilience is created through this sort of um, 
secure presence, right, of a loving and supporting parents like us. So being sensitive to our children's needs actually buffers um, against um, the stress and it builds a foundation of resilience. So it really is this combination of our individual characteristics as well as our environmental and our relational experiences that, that children navigate. And, and the research shows that resilient kids are more likely to take healthy risks because they don't necessarily fear falling short you know, of expectations. They tend to be curious and they tend to be trusting of their instincts. And, and as a result, they tend to know their limits and they can sort of step outside of their comfort zone. They can solve problems independently and they can also ask for help when, when they need it. So we don't get a lot of say over the personalities and the temperaments that our children are born with, but we do play a huge role um, in shaping who they become and helping them to sort of build and foster the skills necessary to be resilient human beings. So, we're really going to spend um, the rest of our time talking about two sort of themes or areas in particular that we want to focus on as parents that can really help um, foster this resilience. So we're going to really talk about how kids develop coping skills within the context of caring relationships. So how can we be attuned and responsive within our relationships and within our connections to our kids? Because when they know that they have this sort of unconditional support, they feel empowered, right? To seek guidance and make attempts to work through difficult situations. And then Zamira is gonna talk about how we as parents can help build these skills of resilience and confront sort of uncertainty by teaching our children to solve problems independently. And also to sort of sit with these difficult feelings that are just sort of a natural part of life. So I think it's sort of, it, it can be helpful to sort of look at resilience um, with this visual of a balance or a balance scale or a seesaw. So you have these protective sort of experience or positive outcomes on one side, like, you know, warm and supportive parenting and coping skills and a stable environment and just sort of general, um, you know, positive experiences that, that can counterbalance significant adversity on the other side. So even when the load um, is heavy and that negative sort of outcomes are stacked against us, um, and that load is heavy, right? For some of us right now, and there's no sugarcoating that with what we've lived over the last you know, year and a bit, that can be pretty weighing pretty heavy on us. But we all know people, and perhaps we're thinking of ourselves and our children, you know, who the load on that negative side is pretty heavy, yet we still tend to manage relatively well. And we say like, how is that? What, what, what contributes to that? And if you look at the center of the scale, you know, we have this fulcrum, which really helps to sort of balance out the way that scale is gonna tip. And everybody's fulcrum is actually positioned differently, okay? Depending on where it's positioned is going to determine how easy or difficult it is to tip that scale towards positive outcomes. So this is part of the reason that we react to stress differently and hardship differently. So we might be born with our fulcrum in a certain position, okay? But over time and with experiences, that fulcrum will move for better or for worse, okay? But the good news is that cumulative impact of positive life experiences and our coping skills that we develop shift that fulcrum's position and can actually make it easier to achieve positive outcomes despite the fact that there are still challenges to be faced. We're not, we're not getting away with that in life. Um, so it can be moved by building our toolkit of skills and tapping into our resources. So when we think of that seesaw, we want to think about how we can unload that negative side and load up on that positive side, right, in attempts to move that fulcrum. And the truth is that many of the negative things that we are facing are actually not really that easy to unload. and They're not really that easy to move. Um, we can't necessarily change the fact, obviously, that we're living in a pandemic or, you know, if our family's having financial strain or we can't necessarily change the fact that school is not as fun this year, perhaps, with everything going on or that we can't see our loved ones. Um, so if we can't unload that 
what can we do? And there is a lot to be said about our mindset, right? And the importance of sort of actively managing our stress by naming it and just acknowledging that it's there. That act alone can be quite helpful. By naming that tough stuff, we can also give ourselves and our kids some, some grace, right? By reframing expectations for ourselves uh, and for our kids. And, and when I say that, I don't mean that we're going to sort of skirt our responsibilities or slack off in some way or even drop the bar. But it's really just about acknowledging that we are living in tough times. Um, and it makes sense that we are experiencing challenges. So I want to now talk about how we can load up on the positive side, and particularly through our supportive and responsive relationships with our kids. Because one thing that resilient people have in common is this healthy sense and the stability within our relationships. And that's probably not surprising to many of us, the idea that you know, relationships matter and that responsive relationships foster and promote resilience. But what does that really mean? Okay, we, we all know that as human beings, we, we require connection. Um, that's kind of what drives us as human beings and makes us kind of unique. But just because we care about someone, it doesn't mean that our relationships are healthy or that they're responsive and helping to build resilience. Um, we might be physically present and with our children and our families all the time, in fact, that seems to be the case <laughs> over the past year that that's, we're together a lot. Um, but do we engage and interact in ways that are attuned and promote resilience? Because it's, it's not enough to just sort of occupy space together. Um, it's what we're doing, right? While we're in that space together. It's the intention that we place on connecting that's going to be important in sort of um, exploring our ability to be responsive and, uh, and connected while we're, while we're together. So when we are sensitive and we're responsive to our children, it allows them to feel safe. It allows them to sort of feel understood, um, which, which brings about this sense of safety and security, okay? Um, not just physically, right, but emotionally as well. And, they experience when this happens, when, they, when there's that sense of safety and that sense of security, um, kids experience less stress, right? Because they have that peace that's feeling very grounded for them. And when they do get overwhelmed, because they will, they tend to recover more quickly. So being attuned and responsive to our kids' emotional states and needs also teaches them how to regulate their own emotions, right? So our responsiveness helps children develop more effective sort of self-soothing mechanisms. Um, and it ultimately is, we're teaching and coaching our kids how to cope, you know, even when we're not around, even when we're not there to intervene. So by doing this and by acting in ways, it says to our children that I see you, I hear you, I understand you. And, and I think if we think about times where we ourselves are struggling, this is ultimately what we want, right? We want to be heard, we want to be seen, we want to feel understood by those around us. That's what attunement really is, right? It's our ability to be aware of and respond to our child's deeds through warmth, through safety, through a sense of love. And attunement is not about being a fixer, okay? It's not about finding the right answer, or trying to solve problems or take away distress. It's about feeling your child's emotions um, as if they were your own, right? Even if we don't agree with them. So our response both verbally and non-verbally are really important to pay attention to. And ways that we can do that um, is through mirroring and labeling. And children, including our teens, you know, they need help to understand their own emotions. And by mirroring and labeling emotions, we're helping kids to make sense of what they're experiencing. Okay, it can help our kids feel understood and heard when we can actually sort of mirror back um, what it is they're saying and what they're feeling. And in order to actually do this ourselves, it forces us to be in the moment with them. It's really hard to do these things if we're not sort of in the moment with our, with our child. Okay, and when we actually do that, it can build our empathy, right? And our compassion for their situation. So mirroring is this, it's super helpful and it's essential to the emotional development of children because it encourages self-reflection. 
And as I said, it helps kids to feel understood and accepted. And it really does help promote this sort of healthy expression of emotion. So when we mirror and we help to label what we're seeing in our children, it also tells them some profound things that are kind of maybe unspoken, right? That, that they're not alone in this world, that we understand what the, where they're coming from. Okay, it tells them that they're worthy of our care and they're worthy of our focused attention and that their feelings and their thoughts have something important to tell them and, and even something important to teach them. So when your child starts to become, you know, overwhelmed by strong emotions, be it anger, sadness, fear, anxiety, we want to remind ourselves to take first off a giant step back emotionally. And, and this is often the hardest step, you know, for parents. And that's certainly the case for me. Our, our kids can trigger us and that can be challenging. So we need to do our best to sort of stay grounded and to stay calm and clear in those moments rather than get sucked in by our child's pain or their chaos, which is really hard to do. You know, we, we, really, um, we really have this emotional connection that can lead us to sort of envelop what they're, what they're experiencing. So if you notice your health, yourself having these strong emotions and reaction to your, to your child, first of all, you're not alone. Okay, it's really very common. And we wanna just sort of be mindful to take a minute to sort of care for ourselves and get grounded. Um, because if we're not sort of centered and, and kind of grounded in these times, we just simply can't be very helpful to our kids in the moment. So we want to find our center. And then we want to be able to sort of reflect what we're seeing and what we're hearing. Um, and we can do this by using their words as much as possible. You know, it makes sense that you find school super sucky this year. You know, that maybe that's their words and we're reflecting that back to them. Um, and we also want to reflect and mirror their emotion to a certain degree. You know, if your child's kind of revved up or angry about something, you know, we can put some tone in that too. It tells them that, hey, they understand where this is coming from. You know, it makes sense that you're angry with the way that went down. That really makes sense to me. Um, and if they're feeling like really low and really soft and it's in a whisper, then, you know, we want to be able to match that emotion with them too. It sounds like it was a really hurtful experience that you had today. You know, I'm sorry to hear about that. Um, and remember in these moments, it's not about teaching, right? We're not, we're not teaching in this moment, we're connecting and we're relating and we're coming alongside and we're helping our child to feel heard and understood. So at this point, it really is about their feelings, okay? It's, it's not about our feelings. Um, and remember, you can reflect what your child is feeling and not necessarily agree with them. In fact, it's a really powerful thing to do because regardless of how we fundamentally feel about it, we, we want to get to that notion or that idea that we are helping our child to feel understood. So, you know, we might say something like, I, I hear, I, what I hear you saying is that you, you hate having to do chores and you wish that everyone would just leave you alone. Okay, you find it unfair that you can't hang out with your friends the way you used to or you feel that you should be allowed to go to bed later than you currently do because everyone else you know is going to bed later. Then. Okay, we don't have to agree with those statements. Uh, and it doesn't even mean we're gonna sort of change our mind or do anything differently, but we're helping them to feel understood. And then when we do that, we can then actually ask our kids, like, did I get it right? You know, am I, you know, did I, did I get it? Am I on the right track? And if they say, yeah, that's how I'm feeling. Well, awesome, it means that we were able to listen and understand, and then we can kind of move on to the next step. And if we haven't, if some, that's not it at all, then we can kind of back up and say, okay, I'm sorry about that. Can we try again? Because I really do want to understand where you're coming from. And when, we, when our kids do have a sense that we're, we kind of are getting it, we can ask, is there more? And this can really open up things in our conversation. Sometimes, our kids get really upset about little stuff and that's not really what's driving, you know, their concerns like, like chores or schoolwork. But when you mirror and label and reflect with them and we sort of, you know, lay off the teaching and the lectures in those moments and keep our emotions in check, um, they might tell us about the bigger stuff, you know, their heartbreak or their friend issues or, you know, how the pandemic has really been, you know, affecting them. So when our child sees that we are capable of truly engaging with them in this way, they want to trust us and hopefully they'll want to act you know, on that trust. So how we respond 
I hope what I'm conveying um, really does matter. And while it's really important to pay attention to how we respond to our kids when things are tough, it's also really important to pay attention to how we respond when things are going well, okay? Attunement and responsiveness is just as important during positive moments as it is during difficult times. And um, this really struck me um, when I learned about this, and this comes from some of the work at Penn State. Um, they do a lot of work on resilience. And I thought it never really occurred to me how I respond to my kids when things are going well. Um, I, I just figure if, if you're sharing something positive, then that's all going to sort of, you know, re, re, you know, translate into positive experiences. But, um, but the work of Dr. Shelley Gables, she speaks about four different ways or four different styles of response that we tend to have with others. And that only one of those four styles actually serves to strengthen our relationships. And the other three ways tends to kind of erode your relationships. So I just want to share with you some of those responses that tend to erode and break down the connection. And the first one she talked about is being a conversation killer, okay, or, or, or non-starter. So, you know, your child, or for that matter, your spouse or a friend or your partner um, comes to you. How do we kill conversations? We kill conversations by our distractions and our disengagement. And we are a very distracted society right now. And we like to complain about kids and their devices and their screens, but you know, if we're being honest, as adults, we're some of the worst culprits of this. So someone comes to share with us, good or bad, okay, which should first alert us to the importance you know, of this experience. Someone's coming to us to share. This means that we represent something important to this person. And we have to ask ourselves, are we actually giving our full attention? Can we put down our phones? Can we actually orient our bodies and orient our attention to, to the individual? Um, we've all been in situations where we're trying to communicate with someone and we just can't seem to get their full attention. Um, they don't seem engaged And what happens. It, well, it, it does, it kills the conversation. And, and perhaps more importantly, it sends this message that you know, I don't really have time for you, or I'm not really interested, even if that's not our intention, okay? And sometimes it's even a missed opportunity altogether because we're too distracted or disengaged to actually notice that someone needs us um, to be the one to reach out. Another response that erodes is being a conversation hijacker. And simply put, that's just us sh shifting light onto ourselves, you know, when someone is trying to share with us. We, 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 we pull it off the other person and we kind of shine it on ourselves. And we don't do this um, with bad intentions. Okay, we often do this as a way to relate. You know, someone's sharing an experience that, you know, provokes something similar in us and we want to share it. So it comes from a good place, but it, it also is communicating that we're not really attuned with what the other person needs and, and we're making this kind of more about us. And the third one she talked about was being a joy thief. And this really stems when somebody is coming to us, when our child, for example, is coming to us to share something positive. Um, and they're excited to share positive news or a positive idea. And rather than sort of coming alongside of that person in a shared way, we instead point out sort of all the problems and downsides of this good news. And we kind of suck all that positive emotion, you know, out of, out of the person in that moment. Um, which again, if you've ever tried to share an exciting idea you had and people just, or somebody just points out how it might not work or, you know, it kind of it deflates us and it doesn't feel very good. So the way that, you know, being a, an attuned responder is really sort of the one way that we promote sort of this, um, this sense of engagement and this, this way of relating that strengthens relationships. Right, so we want to mirror the person's excitement and positive energy. Or if it is about you know, concern or disappointment, we wanna mirror that as well. Be able to share in the moment and ask questions that help the person to sort of unpack their experience. Um, when we do that, we both feel more connected. It strengthens our relationship. Um, and it just, it allows for that trust to build and that sort of belonging and intimacy to, to grow. Um, but we also have to keep in mind that we're not always going to be attuned. It's not possible, right? We're not always going to be able to be fully present and not distracted and that's okay. You know, there's times that we are going to sort of interject with our own excitement or we're gonna to have to sort of pop someone's bubble because you know, your idea of being five years old and walking the dog alone is just 
it's a great idea, but it's not going to happen. So, you know, the bottom line is really responsive relationships help us to be stronger, help us to be happier and more resilient. And we do that by authentically engaging in, in our conversations and in our interactions. Um, and it helps us to feel understood as we, as we really walk alongside of our kids at these times. So I'm gonna pass things over to Zamira and she's gonna continue talking to us about um, helping our kids develop these, excuse me, these skills. Thank you, Jana. Um, now that we are, we know how to connect and attune to our kids, we are certainly ready to teach them some coping skills. And um, as Jana mentioned, that connection and that um, sort of trusting relationship that we build with our kids allow us to do these things because sometimes it's not easy to do. And I think this last year has really highlighted the need to develop and learn some coping skills. So we can bounce back or our kids can be able to bounce back from some of the difficulties they've been experiencing. And I, I must confess that even resilient people have had a hard time um, this year bouncing back at times and dealing and coping with with a lot of the difficulties so here i've listed some of the things that coping skills really are helping us and and are very important for us and for our children and really these are all one and the same in sort of phrased in different angles so handling new and demanding situations with less anxiety and apprehension um, coping skills can allow us to be more self-reliant, um, which is a very important trait when we're talking about resilience. It's one of those traits that is um, very, uh, very much associated with kids who are resilient. Um, and the last one is having confidence in finding solution and um, handling challenging situations. So we, the, the reality is we often, uh, as adults, we wanna turn um, and help and solve problems and take away a difficult situation that our children are experiencing. Um, but sometimes we need to step back from it. And when kids are faced with problems, solve with different problems and different challenges, if they have their own ability to handle them and cope with them, then they're able to handle the situation much better and have more confidence within themselves to approach situations that are more challenging. So we'll go to the next slide, Jana, please. So how do kids develop coping skills? So one way is by learning to tolerate uncomfortable emotions. When a child feels frustrated because they can't get something right, when they feel disappointment because they are not able to, to you know, get what they wanted or what they're expected. Um, these are really opportunities to help your child accept and be okay with this discomfort or with the uncomfortable emotion that they are feeling. Um, another way to help when kids develop coping skill is when they are faced with age appropriate. We are dealing with different ages, so it has to be age appropriate to your challenges. Um, and, and, and need to deal with them independently with minimal guidance. So when a child is trying to do something or trying something new or making mistakes, making errors, um, by learning that it's okay, um, this is an opportunity to teach them that, that it's okay and they can do it on their own, even if it's not gonna necessarily come out the way they want it. Um, there's something about them needing to figure out things for themselves that is important in developing those coping skills. And the last thing is experiencing the consequences of the action and choices. Um, and a good example here would be homework. Um, if a child is refusing to do homework or um, is rushing through, his, through the homework in a way that it's definitely you know, clearly not going to be done well, sometimes we need to let them face the consequences at school rather than um, ensure that the homework is being done properly. And of course, we need to, do, to, to keep in mind the, the age and development of the child when we are setting them in, in, in terms of how we're going to handle whatever they're tolerating, whatever emotion they're experiencing, whatever challenge they're experiencing. It all depends on their age. So these are more in, in generalities. Next slide, please. So what parents can do, this is the big, big part. Um, when, you, when, when your child is, is experiencing um, a difficulty, when they're having um, a moment in which they are 
clearly showing you verbally, sometimes when they're very young, non-verbally, that they are struggling, I often recommend not to avoid stepping in to let them continue with their efforts, whether they're stacking blocks, whether they're tying shoelaces for older kids, whether they're trying to do their homeworks. Um, whenever they encounter those difficulties, it's even important to step back and let them try and figure it out for themselves before we jump in and try and solve the problem for them. Of course, we need to support them if they need it. And that attunement and that connection you have with your child allows you to know your child very well and to be able to know that this is something that now you need to step in and, and help or your child has done what they can and, and now it's your turn to offer that guidance and that support. And of course, at the same time, we have to remember to praise the kids for their effort and their persistence rather than for the outcome. We tend to often praise for the outcome, but sometimes we need to remember that it's about trying, it's about making an effort. Maybe they didn't get it right. Maybe they just had to eventually have you help them uh, figure out what to do, but they did try and that's where they deserve the praise. Um, establishing age appropriate rules and responsibilities is another very important aspect that helps kids develop that coping skill, that resilience. Um, so uh, an example is, is following a, a routine for, from, for coming home from school. So the child arrives back home from school and maybe they have a couple of things they need to do like clearing out their lunchbox, taking their own snack, putting the clothes away before they go ahead and, and, and go and play or do whatever it is that they, they are waiting to do. And, and the reason why it, it, it is important for them to have those responsibilities is not just for them to learn how to do these things, of course, that's part of it, but also for them to be able to uh, take initiative and do it on their own. And that's where the other part is very important to gradually refrain from constantly reminding them and prompting them to do it. Because if they will always be reminded and told you've got to do this and then you've got to do that, you've got to empty your lunchbox, you've got to put things away, they will not be able to figure out themselves what they need to do when the time comes. So maybe for routines, they're able to do it. And then that will carry over for other things when, when, when they are faced with a challenge or with a situation where they have to figure out what do I need to do at this moment. Um, and, and, and sometimes it's very Im important to figure out what it is that they're capable of doing before you set up the responsibility. So again, it has to be age appropriate. You figure out what your child is capable of doing. Um, you don't give them something that's too easy or too difficult and something that maybe slightly challenges them and have that uh, as a, a responsibility for them to follow. And gradually as they get older, you can add more responsibilities and more things that you're expecting them to do. And the third area is encouraging your child to find solutions. Um, that means things like teaching problem solving skills or alternate ways to handle frustrations or uh, stepping um, out of their comfort zone. Um, in this situation, it would be something like if your child is um, having a difficulty with a, with, a, with, an, with a grade, they got a grade on, a, on an assignment that they didn't like, maybe encourage them to go and talk to the teacher before you go and and, and inquire or write an email to the teacher about, about the situation. It could be maybe you're out with your child and they um, need to go to the bathroom and they have to ask and, and figure out where they would be one. Maybe have them figure out what, where, where would they look for? How would they go about looking for, um, for a bathroom in, in, in the mall or in, in some area that they are uh, before you jump in and, and take them by the hand and lead them to where they need to go. Um, what we want to do again is to try to spare our kids sometimes from, from having to, to deal with the, those negative feelings that they're feeling, those discomfort feelings that they go through when things are not going their way. And children often, and I see that often in my, in my, my work, is that they are often very, very frustrated quite easily and especially during these times, there's a lot of things that are not going our way right now. And their level of frustration is probably the threshold is a little lower than it should be. However, that does, this is really an opportunity to allow them to figure out how to deal with the situation rather than tr to try and fix it for them and get us to be, to be the ones who would 
um, step in and, and deal with the situation. And, and one of the ways to do that is through problem solving. And I'm gonna go over a few kind of little steps to help uh, guide you through problem solving with your, with your children. Next uh, slide. And before I do that, I just want to go back to one of the things that Jana spoke about in terms of that connection and that responsiveness. And regardless of what your child is doing, whether they're feeling frustration because they can't get something done, or they're feeling disappointment, where they are having difficulty doing a, a certain task and, and they're expected to do it on their own, the important part is to validate and show empathy. That's the connection, the positive connection. That's the responsiveness that you're showing them. But that does not necessarily mean that you need to take away that unpleasant emotion. I think one of the most important things that we can do is to help kids understand that unpleasant emotions are okay and that they can handle them. And if they are able to handle those unpleasant emotions, they are also able to enjoy, I think, the, the pleasant emotions better because they are able to have that ability to overcome them themselves and the accomplishment and, and the feeling of overcoming their own difficulties that's really what self-esteem is about. We often feel like self-esteem is about doing well in, in math or being really good in sport, but self-esteem is really, comes from the objective accomplishment that you recognize that you did on your own. And usually that begins when you are able to overcome your, your um, discomfort or your frustration and you feel that you conquered it. And that's really self-regulation as well, right? So these are very important things to keep in mind. Next slide, please. So let's go through a few steps on how to teach problem solving. So I'm gonna give an example, we'll start with an example, a non-COVID example. So your child comes to you and they say they had a project or an essay for school due tomorrow and they forgot about it, they're freaking out, they don't know what to do. They don't know if they're gonna be able to do it. Today, they want you to step in, maybe write an email that, you, that there was a reason why they weren't able to do it. Um, and obviously, you're not going to be doing that. You're going to help them problem solve. So the, you would use guiding questions. So very important not to sort of um, have them think and have them kind of be a bit more um, able to, to think for themselves and how to do it. So you take, take it, so you kind of talk it through a little bit. Uh, you have it more di the, di the conversation directed by the child by you asking these kind of guiding questions like, how much can you get done tonight? Um, what will happen if it is late? Um, and then what can you do about it? Or, and how big is the problem? Uh, depending on their reaction, it might be a very big problem or maybe the reaction indicates that it's, they're making it into a bigger problem than it is. It's only a small fraction of, of what they need to do and it doesn't count for many points. Etc. Etc. So those are the kind of guiding questions and how you talk it out through um, through the first step. Once you, the problem is a little bit clearer and more defined, you ask your child to come up with solutions. So what can you do? And I mean, they could be come up with many different solutions, but in this case, maybe they would ask for an extension or they would um, try and get it done as much as they can. Maybe they'll be able to do it uh, if they really stick to it the whole evening. But, you know, and then you kind of maybe ask them which one they prefer to do. Would they like to ask for the extension? And of course you would ask them to ask their teacher themselves, or would they like to go ahead and try and do it themselves as much as they can tonight? Um, and then they try one solution and they explore the outcome with them, right? So what, it's, it's how, did it, how did it play out? If you ask your teacher for an extension, what happened? What did your teacher say? Um, how many, how much time do you have to continue doing it? Um, and how do you feel now that you've sort of done this this way and dealt with it on your own? And maybe you lost some points, but the, you, you solved the problem on your own. And maybe next time this happens, they might not even need you to do that for them, hopefully, right? And another example that I want to, to give is maybe more a COVID example, because not all problem solving situations actually have a solution. In this case, there was a solution. Maybe it was a solution that ended with some points lost on the essay, but sometimes we don't have solutions. Um, and that's why I'm, I'm going for a COVID example. So something is canceled that the child has been really looking forward to and you, you really can't 
there is no solution, you can't bring it back. Um, but how would you walk your child through a problem like that? So again, defining the problem, you, you can't have the birthday party that you wanted. Um, you can't invite friends over. Um, how do you feel about that? Um, what, what's the part the most difficult for you? Um, talk it out in a, in a more emotional and more um, defining way in terms of how you um, interact with them on an empathy, compassion level, right? But still have them think it out a little bit for themselves. And then, of course, solutions. Maybe there are no solutions, but what, what can we do? A solution can be, well, maybe I, I, I won't have my birthday party, but I have something else instead. Or maybe I just want a big hug, right? Maybe I just want comfort. Maybe what I need is, is, is my, you to comfort me right now and make me feel a bit better. That is a solution for that moment, right? And again, even if it's a solution like that, it does need a bit of a follow-up and to explore the outcome. So you didn't end up having your birthday. We did something else instead. Um, how do you feel now? I still feel disappointed maybe, but maybe they can also recognize that they were able to get through it and that it wasn't as bad as they thought. And there are alternative ways to deal with situations that, um, that are not necessarily fixable. So those are kind of examples of, um, of different ways to problem solve with your, with your children. Obviously not every problem is, is necessary to do all these steps. And the way I see it and the way I explain to parents is that if we gradually do this as children grow and we give them little um, um, experiences um, in terms of doing things for themselves, problem solving, relying on themselves, learning about consequences um, of when, they're, when, when they're expected to do things for themselves. Gradually, they learn these things. Um, and you don't have to spend every interaction with them doing these kind of problem solving activities and, and paying attention to these nitty gritty little things. Um, so insert, find ways to insert them in, in, in the way you, you sort of approach your child and in, in the way you, you handle some of their challenges and some of their difficulties that they're experiencing. And slowly they will get better at doing this sort of thing for themselves. And the, these things are very much related to the way kids handle a lot of things in the future. So kids who are able to problem solve and have these coping skills tend to handle things much better in the future. And when they're faced with situations that are much more challenging, whether it's at school, when they're teenagers, when they're young adults, um, and they can rely on, on themselves to be able to have that confidence to handle situations that are challenging. And, and that's really what resilience is all about. Thank you. So I guess now we'll open it up for, uh, for questions. I don't know how much time we have left. So um, before we get there, I guess I want to thank Jan and Zmira for a great presentation um, as a parent. It's always wonderful to think about um, issues of resilience, but most importantly for me, different strategies that uh, one, one might want to try out. Um, so, Jana, maybe we'll um, take down the PowerPoint so we can see everybody in the audience. Um, as Mira mentioned, we have about 15 minutes plus to uh, for any questions that one might have. So, as I mentioned in the chat, uh, because everybody's microphone is closed, we want to invite everybody to just type in the chat uh, any questions they might have, and then um, we will uh, pose them. And, and uh, as in the past, as Mira and Jana have some really great uh, responses. I want to add before we before we get the first question, there is a, a, we are sharing the slides with the participants, and there is a, uh, the last uh, slide is resources. Um, some of them are videos, which um, are really good videos to help um, have parents some idea on how to do this problem solving. Some of the things that I discussed and some of the coping skills that I talked about. And some are actually videos for kids to watch themselves with their parents. So they're very useful and, and will allow parents to have a little bit more detail because there wasn't a lot of time to go through the details. I'm Great. actually going to put some of those right into the chat so that people can sort of open them in their browsers if they want and take a look at them when it works for you. Um, great, thank you very much. So we have our first question, um, which I'm going to pose. So the question goes, um, what would you do in a situation where your kids don't do what they're supposed to do? Um, 
where they're not supposed to, so let me start again. Um, what would you do in a situation where your kids don't do what they're supposed to do? For example, their chores after school. You said not to remind them, but what is the alternative? So I don't know if I mentioned it. I think it was in the slide, but maybe I, I skipped that, but it's very important to have consequences attached to what you decide the responsibility is. So those consequences have to be um, uh, acceptable and reasonable consequences. So if your child is expected to do uh, one or two things when they get home in terms of chores and they're not doing it, there has to be a consequence attached to it. And you have to be prepared and willing to be consistently um, able to follow through. That is very important. So one of the easiest one nowadays that I, that I talk to a lot of parents about is, uh, is, is devices. So you wanna go, they get home from school, they wanna go on the iPad or their computer, you do your chores, you can go on your computer. You don't do your chores, computer is gone. That's it. You take it away. You don't allow it um, until it's done. Um, and you have to follow through. Now, often with young kids, this will be sometimes a battle. It might end up with a child having a tantrum, yelling, screaming, or just sulking, or being very stubborn. And, and that's difficult for parents, but giving in is not going to help and you need to sort of work that through and and again if you have that connection with your child where you can sit and maybe have that conversation with your child when they come um, and explain to them um, what the <clears throat> expectation is and um, and why why they you're expecting them to do what they're doing sometimes just doing that may help them next time be able to follow through a little bit better and that's why I say also start with something that you know they can do that's not too demanding. If it's very demanding, then, then it's going to be more difficult. Start very gradually. Have them do one thing when they get home. And after maybe a week, so, you know, you put your lunchbox away. Now I also want you to maybe put your clothes in, you know, in the hamper or whatever. And, and just gradually work through that so you have less of that big battle with your children. But following through on consequences is very important. Great, thank you. Um, before I pose the next question, I also want to invite people, uh, if they feel more comfortable, you can also write a question privately to myself. And um, that way I can, I can ask that question anonymously. So the next question we had here was, um, can you clarify labeling for me? So mm -hmm. um, I think it was Jana spoke about labeling. Can you uh, say a few more words about that? Sure. So when, when I talk about labeling, I'm really referring to sort of looking and seeing and feeling what your child is feeling and being able to sort of identify that and express it back to them, you know, in a way that conveys sort of empathy and compassion. So I can give you a concrete example. You know, um, it was my now six-year-old's birthday a couple of weeks ago. And unfortunately, I had to travel out of province for a family circumstance. And I actually missed her birthday. Um, so when I had to break the news to her that not only am I going away, which I haven't been away from my children in a very long time, um, which created a whole situation, I'm actually going to miss your birthday. I and mean, you can imagine what that did to a five-year-old to hear that your mother's not going to be present at your birthday. So as she starts to cry hysterically and, and sort of, you know, be unconsolable, um, she actually wasn't unconsolable because I labeled that back to her. Right? I said to her, I, first of all, I just was present with her and I reflected that sense of emotion in her. Right? I, it's sad for me too. It's sad for me to see you this sad. So I'm, I'm sort of, I'm not happy about this either. So my, my actual affect expresses that, that this is hard. Okay? And then the words I used were simply just labeling what I'm seeing. Okay? This is, I know this is really, really sad for you. I know it makes you really upset to think that I can't be at your birthday. If you're, I'm almost like, I'm almost poking the bruise a little bit, but in doing so, I'm helping her to see that I get it. I'm not trying to convince you not to have this emotion. I'm actually joining you in this emotion and I'm, I'm labeling it for you because it's also sometimes difficult for young kids to sort of put words to the emotions, right? She, she got very upset and she needed some help to kind of process what she's feeling in her little body that was really overwhelming you know i'm sad too that i'm not going to be here i really i really would like to be present for your birthday and i know it makes you really sad that i won't be here and then we went into like zamira's steps that she talked about made me think about how you then walk someone through that you know 
we, we sort of, we, we hash it out and we, we bring it to light. We put it out on the table and we take as much time as we need to do that in that moment. Uh, and then we worked on sort of problem solving the situation. What can we do? Okay, what can we do in light of this new circumstance? Yeah. And I just want to add that the labeling comes into play very much when we want to kids, teach kids to handle those, those unpleasant emotions. Because they, when, they, when we don't label it and we don't do what Jana just described, then the child is feeling that the emotion is something that needs to go away immediately. It needs to be taken away and, and we need to figure out how to do that. But this way, she learned that it's okay to feel this way because mom feel this way and it's, it's, it's the situation. And that's how we start learning to, to understand that the, the, the emotion is something that is, is tolerable. That's, that's really important to highlight, Samira, because I think in that situation, to, to know that you can sit, we can sit in this, like we can be in this type of emotion and still survive. You know, we can survive this moment of extreme disappointment um, and know that we're, we're, we're in this together. Um, and as, as yucky as it feels, it's, it's going to be okay. You know, we're here together and we're going to support one another through this. Great, thank you. Um, the next question uh, that was posted was, um, how can I deal with anxiety from a child when I ask her in a calm way to do something for me? Um, is that normal? Okay, um, so I, I'm trying to understand what you meant by anxiety. It's not clear from the question. Wait, if the child is asked, is asked to do something and they respond in an anxious way? Yeah, let's... Is uh, that let's, what let's I'm understanding? That. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so sometimes at the, uh, it's, uh, kids may, for some reason, be very afraid to do something. It's out of their comfort zone. They don't think they're able to do it. They don't think they're able to handle the situation very well. And it comes out as anxiety. Um, that's what maybe um, this situation is. I can see in the chat, a child responds in an irate way. Okay, I uh, honestly, I'm not sure what the word irate means. So <laughs> I will leave it, we'll leave it at that. Um, but if, if there is that kind of response, again, we are, we're having a, um, an unpleasant reaction to something that the child um, perceives as un unpleasant for them, or they don't feel confident that they're going to be able to do it. Angry, okay, it means angry. So I, sometimes the anger and the anxiety are overlapping. Young kids can respond with anger when they're anxious, and sometimes when they're angry, they're really anxious or vice versa, right? So. To me, it's a perception that the child feels that either they can't do it, it's too difficult to do it, or it feels so unpleasant that they don't want to even venture to try and do it, right? And that's really when we can walk them through what needs to, you know, how you can get it done. And maybe start by one little step is, you know, if it's a certain task that requires something that takes 10 minutes, maybe you can start with the first five minutes. If it's a task that has two or three steps, maybe figure out what is the first step that the child can do. And maybe that will make it more doable for them. And maybe that discomfort that they're feeling of doing just five minutes or one step that they can handle. And, and then again, gradually next time, maybe they can handle more. I hope that answers the question. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, so we have another question here. Um, and I, I'm going to do a little interpretation. The question is, does the current situation, which I'm, I'm guessing is, is COVID, um, does the current situation change anything really? It sounds like the way um, that we deal with children is universal um, empathy and love and having them learn to deal with the issues arising. So, um, I mean, how has the situation, this is my interpretation, how is the situation of COVID, um, has it changed the way that we build up resilience in kids? No, I think it's exactly the same. We have to maybe be a bit flexible and a bit mindful about the fact that they're maybe experiencing more challenges and more situations that are unpleasant for them. And, and we may need to be a bit flexible around how we do things. But the, the premise and the, the, the essence of how we deal with it is the same. Kids can still, and in fact, this is an opportunity for kids to learn how to cope. There's so many opportunities 
around what's happening for them to learn to problem solve, to figure out new ways to deal with situations. And when I mean flexible is, is maybe we do it grad more gradually, maybe we guide more, maybe we comfort more and, and, um, and support more in terms of, of uh, situations that are very difficult and are challenging for kids. But we still need to go through these motions of allowing them to try and deal with things on their own and tolerate some of it on their own and um, you know have responsibilities and and have you know that kind of problem solving sometimes i feel like COVID has become almost sometimes a, too much of an excuse for some kids i know that with my teenager oh it's COVID. you know i can't you know it's it's a good excuse not to do what we need to do because we're so miserable because it's COVID. And sometimes I, I really have to you know, put a stop to that and say, well, yeah, it's COVID, but you can still do it despite the fact that we're, you know, we're in this situation. So it's a balance. It's a bit of a balancing act and it makes things a bit more tricky, but I think that, that the resiliency is even more important than, than ever. Thank you. Um, and there's a comment, which I, I, I wanna read out because I've often been, well, speaking of resilience, uh, there's one question around, um, it is surprising how most of the student population is very easygoing, even with the COVID restrictions. Um, just speaking from my own situation, um, my, you know, my daughter just accepts the fact that she wears a mask every day. And I think that's, I'm surprised and I find that resilient. It is very that, resilient. Yeah, and I think that's just a good reminder. I mean, I think, you know, for those of Zamir and I who work in schools, of course, you know, frustration tolerance, you know, might be sort of um, impacted these days and, and people are perhaps a bit more on edge, but overall children blow my mind every day at how resilient they are and how they kind of have been able to roll with these punches. In fact, often better, you know, than, than a lot of the adults around us or even ourselves can, which it does speak to um, the resilience that our children have and the work that we've obviously done with our kids to, to foster that in them currently. Um, and I think sometimes we don't always give kids the credit that they deserve, that they can handle more than we think they can. Uh, and in fact, they, they in some circumstances, um, as the mayor said, they're, they're developing this skill set maybe at a, a faster and, and, and better rate than they would. I'm, I'm not wishing this pandemic on us, obviously, but there is an opportunity. Uh, there's a very strong teaching opportunity that's presented itself in this, in this past year, um, which I think hopefully um, will serve us well, you know, despite what we're living. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there is another question and comment, but before we do that, I want to acknowledge that it is eight o'clock, uh, the time that we said, um, that this webinar would go for. Um, both Zmira and Jana mentioned that they are willing to stay a, a bit longer, so maybe for another 10 or 15 minutes. But uh, for people that do need to leave, I want to thank everybody for joining us um, and spending your, part of your evening with us. I want to again thank the Center of Excellence for Mental Health, especially Zmira and Jana, for sharing their expertise. Uh, once again, another wonderful um, webinar that is relevant to uh, the things that us as parents are dealing with. Um, so again, thank you very much for that. So um, I'm going to just tweet a quick comment and then I'll go to a question. Another comment was, the best gift that we could give our children is compassion, morals, and ethics. Parents are responsible to show and teach this to our children. So again, this notion, um, I think, echoing what you, you said before uh, in terms of modeling and, and, and great strategies. So I have a question here. It's, um, it's a little bit, um, there's a few different parts, so I'm just going to... Uh, read it out. So the question is, what can you do if you label the emotion and they get upset because they deny feeling that emotion? For example, my daughter is upset at a friend at school because she's teasing someone who she had a crush on and she gets mad at the girl because of that. She already spoke to the girl about it, but the girl continues to do this in front of her, disregarding her feelings. So I asked her, does that make you feel jealous? And she gets mad. How do we deal with that? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. And I think that sort of goes back to what I was talking about is, you know, we don't want to, we have to be careful in those steps, right? Sometimes when we, we, um, we ask or we imply what could be going on and we get it wrong, that can kind of get our, our child's back up, 
you know, which we don't always guess right. You know, there's a bit of guesstimation going on when our kids are in the state they're in. I would simply just ask, you know, help me to understand what you are feeling, you know, ask for that clarification. Because, and, and we want to be also be expressing that notion that we truly do want to understand. You know, if I didn't get it right, help me to understand. What is it that's, what is it that it's making you feel? What's up when she says those things or does these things, you know, where do you go with that information? So it's okay to get it wrong. It's okay to not, you know, sort of guess the emotion or the state, right? Um, but we can ask for clarification. And as long as I think we're being, we're not insisting that we know, the worst thing we can do is tell anybody that, <laughs> that we know how they're feeling. And maybe there's part of that that is jealousy, that they, they're not really maybe ready to sort of go there. Um, and that's okay. But as long as we're sort of remaining open and curious um, and, and conveying to our kids that I, I truly aim to understand what it is that you're experiencing, so help me to understand what it is that was happening in this experience. That sounds really not pleasant. Like that we can probably agree on. Mm -hmm. Samira, would you add to that? Um, if it's a young child and sometimes they don't have the words, the, you know, the actually the vocabulary. Um, I mean, sometimes adults don't have the vocabulary either. I learned a new word today, but sometimes maybe we can offer them um, different words right or they can make up their own word um, for what they feel because emotions are very individual and we know that um, when we attach a, a, a word to an emotion the emotion becomes much more defined so maybe their emotion is not exactly jealousy or not exactly something else and they can make up their own word and describe what their emotion is and that's okay that's how they feel and um, that's actually one technique that we use with kids to make up their own emotional words for things that they really feel that they are feeling and nobody seems to know exactly what they're feeling. Great, a very, uh, I'll use the word interesting strategy, but I think it a is. really wonderful strategy. Yeah. It's, not, it's not a strategy that I invented actually, but it's a, a strategy that actually really works very well, especially with, uh, with young kids. Wonderful. So, um, seems to me that we, um, there's no more questions, so I'll, I'll just pause for one more second um, to see if there's any last questions. But um, in general, I wanna thank everybody again for joining us.